Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Zoom webinar today. We're delighted you've taken the time to be with us. On behalf of the five-star accredited Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce, I want to welcome you to this webinar. My name is Jim Rice, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chairman of the Education Division of the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce. And we're really delighted that you're here and appreciate you joining us for a deep dive a deep dive into the local history of Fort Bend County. Uh, I think when we're finished, you'll walk away with the necessary content and the historical context to engage in sharing with your friends, your peers, and other community members uh, here in Fort Bend County. Uh, our sponsor for this event this morning is Rice and Gardner Consultants, big supporter of public education. And before I introduce our speaker, I wanna point out that there is a chat box at the bottom of the screen. And we want to encourage you to post your questions in using that chat box feature. But we're gonna wait until the end of the presentation to answer them. So uh, it'll give our presenter uh, opportunity to give you the full, full presentation and then we'll answer at the end. So I would at this time like to introduce Ms. Chastity Alanu Alade, who is the Coordinator for Community and Civil Engagement in Fort Bend ISD. She holds a bachelor's degree in history and secondary education from Louisiana State University, go Tigers, as well as a master of education in secondary social studies from Texas Southern University. During her education, a major focus of her coursework and area of research has been African American Studies and History of the American South. Chastity moved to Texas to pursue a career in education in 2006, where she served as a classroom teacher of eighth grade American history for seven years before becoming an instructional coach for secondary social studies. She's currently a leader and, a, and an advocate for the education of the convict leasing system and the memorialization of the Sugarland 95. In addition to presenting a wide range of professional development sessions, she has organized and presented Understanding Our Local History, a teacher symposium on convict leasing, and served as both panelist and presenter at the Texas Southern University Diversity Conference for Multicultural Education. So would you please join me in welcoming Ms. Uh, Chastity All, All I Knew Alade. You're, you're muted, Chastity. Thank you so much, Mr. Rice, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here today with all of you um, to present on the Sugar Lane 95. Um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and, and share my screen so that way we, we can go ahead and get started. Sorry about that. Oh, let me stop sharing. This is always the fun part. It's getting, yeah. getting it powered up. So you've got, uh, is it letting you share, Chastity? Now it is. Now it is. I'm just trying to get the screen set up on my end. It's, there we go. I, are you able to see my screen? It's, it's black right now. It's, there, there it is. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let me start back from the beginning. All right. Thanks everyone for bearing with me. There we go. So today I'm going to take you um, on a, about a 55 minute journey um, to tell you the story of the Sugarland 95. Uh, again, I'm always honored and humbled to pre present this content, not only as a studier of social studies and history and as a former history teacher, but as a community member 
uh, of Fort Bend County. This subject is very near and dear to my heart. With that being stated, I, I recognize that many of you in the webinar today are, are coming at a different entry point of background knowledge. Some of you, uh, such as Mr. Rice and many of our Fort Bend ISD family members, um, have, are considered experts because you've been part of the journey from the very beginning. Whereas others of you might be new to this topic as you've recently seen it in the headlines, um, in the newspaper, or on the local news. So with that, I want to start um, to build a little bit of background of how did we essentially get to where we are today before I jump into a lot of the historical context. So just a short recap and a timeline. In November of 2011, Forbin ISD purchased a large tract of land to be the site of a future campus. In November 2014, a bond was approved that allowed for the construction of what would once become the James Reese CTE Center. In October of 2017, um, as construction was about to begin, Forbin ISD got a call from the Texas Historical Commission. You see, the Texas Historical Commission contacted the district because they had been contacted by a local community member, the late Mr. Reginald Moore. Now, he was once a prison guard at the local state prison in the area, and he had spent many years doing research, extensive research about the history of convict leasing and how it impacted the area. He had also developed a reputable name for himself as an advocate, for the awareness and the education of the convict leasing system. So this sort of rang the alarm and, and put it on the district's radar in order to, to make sure that we did the due diligence that needed to be done. And so from October of 2017 to January 2018, the district employed an archeological firm by the name of Goshawk Environmental Consulting to be on site during the construction. As you see on the, uh, the, the backhoe tractor there, Mr. Rain Clark, he was the head archeologist at the site and he made a personal commitment to oversee the work in the event that something was found. Now it goes without saying that on February 19th of 2018, that historic day, the first bone fragments were discovered while digging a drainage ditch um, for the new campus. The bone fragments were found in soil along with other fragments um, that dated to prehistoric materials. As many individuals uh, at the site thought, that the question was, well, what are these? Are they Native American relics? Are they animal bones? Um, no one was sure at that exact moment of what they found. So testing was necessary. The bone fragments were sent off to be tested while construction was halted. After testing was conducted, it was concluded that they were indeed human, as you see in the image there. Now, according to Mr. Rain Clark, initially they thought they found possibly a single site or a small family cemetery. What I want you to understand prior to getting into the details is that what was found were, was a grave site with no marker, no headstone, nothing that would allude to the presence of a cemetery. But as the digging continued, it was easily realized that what was being unearthed was a very large cemetery with boundaries. Now, exactly how many bodies did they find? As we all know now, in total 95. With the discovery of those 95 bodies ha came along a long and arduous process that's still ongoing to be able to determine exactly who are these individuals. So the big idea question I'm posing today that many of you came to this webinar to answer is who are the Sugarland 95? Now, although I was a district employee in 2018, I was actually one of the social studies coordinators when the discovery took place. I watched this unfold on the nightly news as many of you did. And as a historian and as a community member, several questions flooded my, my mind. 
the first question was, who are these people and why are they there? Then I thought to myself, who put them there? Why didn't anyone know that they were there? Then you fast forward a little bit and you think, well, why are they just now being found? Who forgot about them? But as a historian, I'm thinking, how did they get forgotten all these years? And why were they forgotten? Then the human side starts to kick in and you think, well, oh, well, how did these, these people die? When did they die? Where did they, where did they die? And then the, the painful part comes in when you actually ask yourself, who were these people? Who were they when they were alive? So again, these are just some of the questions that I wrestled with when I initially found out about the discovery. And I'm sure that those are some of the same questions that many of you have in your mind as we launch into this presentation. But as, as any good history teacher knows, uh, a history course should not be a, a list of synthesized facts that you present to your students. Instead, you should challenge your students to think about history as a sequence of events. Now, uh, I'm known for saying that no singular event in time occurs in a vacuum. All events have causes and effects. Some events have causes that are so deeply rooted in the past that it's hard to make a connection to the present. And there are other events that have such a long-standing impact into the future that it's hard to deny uh, the, the, the impact of that event. So today, versus me just coming out and answering that question, who are the Sugar Land 95, I'm going to ask for your permission to take you on a historical journey across time, across place, and across this space that we call Fort Bend County, which many of us refer to as home. So if you don't mind, I ask you to make yourself comfortable. Feel free to take notes. And um, for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to help you build some background so you can walk away with the certainty when answering that question, who are the Sugarland 95? So I'm going to start where most of uh, us as Texas residents, our history of Texas begins, which is around 1820. This gentleman here is Stephen F. Austin, for those of you who are not familiar. He's known as the father of Texas. And during the 1820s, um, it was realized just how valuable the land in Texas was by Anglo settlers. And with the permission of the Mexican government, Stephen F. Austin was granted some, some land grants and he issued some of his earliest land grants to settlers right here in the Sugarland area. Now, landowners were attracted to the rich soil around the Brazos River. It was, it was red and it was well suited for farming and ranching and uh, the growth of cash crops, such as cotton, corn, and sugar. Now these land grants are leagues, as you see in the map, those long strips of land, they consisted of 4,428 acres of land. And the first homesteads of the O300 were called Fort Settlement, later known as Fort Bend, right where, where, where I'm sitting today. This was the beginning of colonization in Texas. Now, in 1828, Mr. Samuel Williams was the chief administrator and secretary for Stephen F. Austin, and he was actually given a, a large league of land where Sugarland got its original start as the Oakland Plantation. And it was on that Oakland Plantation that Mr. Williams' family built a raw sugar mill in 1828. Now, eventually, the Williams Plantation was sold to this gentleman by the name of Benjamin Franklin Terry and his partner, William Kyle. They were successful gold prospectors returning to Texas. Those of you who teach American history, there were successful gold prospectors, and he was one. And it was B.F. Terry who renamed the Oakland Plantation Sugarland Plantation. 
1858, Sugarland Plantation grew to 12,500 acres and was one of the largest plantations in Texas. Using their, their high profits and extreme wealth, Terry and his partner started the first railway, right around here, known as the Buffalo Bayou Brazos and Colorado Railway in Texas. Now, this railway is essential. I need you to imagine you own 12,500 acres of land and you're harvesting sugar. It's a lot of land and a lot of sugar. So you have to have a way to efficiently bring the cane from the fields into the mill. So the railroad was essential. Now, a little bit of history trivia for those of you who like trivia. I'm going to put a date on the, on the board and I want you to jot it down or log it in your brain and, and see if you know what happened. This map is a map of Fort Bend County in the year 1865. Now there's something important that occurred between 1861 and 1865. For those of you who stated the Civil War, go ahead and give yourself a, a round of applause or a pat on the back or a gold star for the day, because that's the correct answer. Now, after the Civil War, Texas plantations were in severe states of distress and or ruin. You see in the map here, these strips of land, again, are the original leagues that surround the county. Now, although Sugarland Plantation managed to, to survive the destruction of the war, it was the decline of sugar production that really hurt the plantation. And after years of maintaining the farm, the heirs of that Terry Kyle Plantation were forced to sell the plantation. I want to introduce you to these two names. They're very important. If you're taking notes, you might care to jot them down. In 1868 through 1865, two former Confederates turned wealthy businessmen would become the new owners of vast tracts of land, including what was once the old Hodges, Battle, Cartwright Leagues, as well as the Terry and Kyle Plantation. I'll introduce you to the names of Mr. E. H. Cunningham and Littleberry A. Ellis, because it was with the partnership of these two men that in five years, they had owned most of Fort Wayne County. Mr. Cunningham owned the 12,500 acres, once known as Sugarland Plantation, and other smaller plots of land in Bayer County, and Mr. Ellis owned 5,300 acres in Fort Bend and other substantial farms in Brazoria County. But it was in their partnership that they would become owners of that original Sugar Land Plantation, including the mill. A little bit more about Mr. Ellis. He's going to play a, a, a critical role in what we discussed today. Mr. Ellis purchased what was once the, the Hodges Bend League. That's a very familiar term to those of us who live here in Fort Bend. And it was with this purchase, he gained ownership of a tract of land once called Walker Station, conveniently located along the railroad route, directly um, in line to the refinery. It was a very important piece of land and he renamed it Sertarsha Plantation after his daughter. Now, we all should have a lingering question in our minds at this point. We've talked about the end of the Civil War and plantations were essentially falling apart and these men coming in to scoop them up, but we know that with the end of the war also came the end of slavery. So how does one own so much land when there's no labor force? So why would they be purchasing so much land is the question we should all have. And more importantly, who is going to work all of that land? Now, with the ending of the Civil War and the emancipation of slaves, 
came the enforcement of what's known as the Civil War Amendments. If you teach 7th or 8th grade or you, you remember those courses, it's 13, 14, 15, right? Free citizens vote. That's how my kids remembered it. So the 13th Amendment essentially abolished slavery. The, the, the institution that was critical to the success of the Southern Planting Society. But it wasn't that amendment on the surface that had an impact on history, but we have to really dig deeper into the text of that amendment. You see, the 13th Amendment reads that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment of a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or in any place subject to its jurisdiction. That small clause, except as a punishment of a crime, made way for a new system to replace slavery, a system known as convict leasing. Now, convict leasing is also known as slavery by another name, which is well documented in the Douglas Blackman book titled as such. So what I'd like to do is take a second and show you a small snippet from the PBS documentary based on Mr. Blackman's work, which is also titled Slavery by Another Name. I have a brother about 14 years old. A man hired him from me and I heard of him no more. He went and sold him to McGree and they have been working him in prison for 12 months. He's done nothing wrong for them to keep him in chains. Written more than 40 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, these letters bear witness to a sinister and a little known chapter in American history. Whenever one is in a conversation where someone says, What's wrong with black people? Why can't they get over it? Slavery ended 150 years ago. That's fundamentally false. The reality is that slavery and all of the, the limitations that it imposed on the future and the potential and the progress of African-American families, it didn't end 150 years ago, it continued until World War II, well into the lives of large numbers of African Americans today. For more than 80 years following the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of African Americans in the South were pulled back into the shadow of slavery. Buying and selling African Americans ended with the 13th Amendment, but that did not translate into actual freedom. One of the fascinating things about the text of that amendment is that it says that slavery is abolished except in the case of a punishment for a crime. With emancipation, the nature of both crime and punishment in the South changed dramatically. In state after state, county after county, laws were passed to criminalize black life. It was a crime in the South for a farm worker to walk beside a railroad. It was a crime in the South to speak loudly in the company of white women. It was a crime to sell the products of your farm after dark. But the most damaging of all of these laws were the vagrancy statute. In every Southern state, you became a criminal if you could not prove at any given moment that you were employed. Once arrested, convicts released and forced to labor in coal mines, lumber camps, brick factories, and turpentine farms. They were shackled, imprisoned, and tortured, sometimes to the point of death. The fact that blacks were treated the way they were, like animals, people could be just picked up and put in jail. They could be lost in the system. Nobody knew where to find them. They could be buried in some grave somewhere and families still looking for them. Don't know where they are. 
I didn't know that the sheriff department could sell slaves to corporations, steel plants, and coal mines. The constant threat of arrest and forced labor, like the threat of lynching, cast a shadow over the South. Slavery had ended, but true freedom had not begun. Awesome. Can everybody hear me now? Mr. Rice, can you hear me? Okay, great. Great. I apologize. I, I realized the volume may have been a little low for some of you. We'll, we'll get that right the next time. Alrighty, so picking up from there, following the Civil War, Southern planters faced extreme labor shortages, as we would all expect. But in addition to the planters, it was the Texas prison system that was in economic distress and in need of more funding. So this, this desperation, the, the, fear of the, the fear of the unknown, the anger of defeat, all of these factors played a part in the need to develop a new system to help bring back the, the, the Southern prison system. And convict leasing was a natural solution. The convict leasing system began in 1867, shortly after the Civil War in Texas. And in order to maintain the prison system, the state began the practice of leasing out prisoners to private companies by 1871. This system lasted for nearly a decade until the prison operators were reportedly falling behind on payments to the state. They weren't providing adequate housing or food to the inmates. Um, and there were also reports from the workers of neglect, poor working conditions and extremely low wages. So the state had to kind of re think about that system. And by 1877, the state decided to take out a new bid and a proposal for the new lease. Right here, you see that they, they, they pretty much were soliciting new people to, to come to the table to own and operate the prison system. Now, if you took notes, I introduced you to two names a few short slides ago. In 1878, Mr. Ellis and Mr. Cunningham both submitted proposals and they were selected as joint operators of the prison system. This marked the peak of the convict leasing system in Texas. And for five years, they remained in control. By running the prison, they were able to lease out labor to other local farmers, but more importantly, to their own. And you remember just how large their farms actually were. Through this process, they earn handsome profits as they were only to pay the state $3.01 per month per convict. In exchange for the payment, the state would give up supervision to the penitentiary and the convicts to Mr. Ellis and Mr. Cunningham. And together, they created the sugar plantation, um, which, which was its claim to fame. They also invested to revitalize the, the plantation as well as increasing the sugar production throughout the whole of Fort Bend County. They also took their, their profits to develop a new sugar refinery named the Imperial Sugar Mill in 1883. Now, as fate would have it, it was their success that also led to their failure because they were bringing in a lot of money and drawing a lot of attention. And it didn't take long for the state to realize that essentially we were m losing out. So as a result, the state ended the Ellis Cunningham lease after five years and regained control of the prison system by 1884. Now, at the time, the use of convict labor still continued. The only difference is that now it was operated by the state. 
And in 1886, the state legislature started to approve the purchase of large farms, including the Harlem Plantation, which was 2,500 acres of land. And it was with the purchase of these large uh, plots of land that began the large scale state owned convict farming system in Texas. Now, although Mr. Ellis and Mr. Cunningham no longer owned and operated the system, they still leased out prisoners from the state to work on their own farms. If you see on the chart here, this information is taken from the Texas State Penitentiary Biennial Report. It's a report that was, was done every two years from 1880 to 1910, and it included the number of convicts on each farm. And this table is reflective of just one report done in 1892. You can see just how many convicts were working on their, their farms. Now, by 1906, Cunningham experienced financial losses sold his plantation, which operated with over 400 convicts at the time, to the state penitentiary. It was the purchase of this imperial farm that was a smooth transition, as we need to understand that the state gained a, essentially a plantation with an already established labor force. This year also marked the opening of the imperial state prison farm. During that same year, the Cunningham Mill and the Ellis Sartarsha Plantation were sold to Mr. Eldridge and Mr. Kempner, the creators of what would become the Imperial Sugar Company. And these gentlemen were able to transform this, at this time, run-down plantation into the company town of Sugarland, Texas. Now, it goes without saying that the Imperial Sugar Company continue the practice of leasing out convicts from the Imperial State Prison Farm. Now, although Imperial Sugar, as directed by Mr. Eldridge and Mr. Kempner, did not take part in the use of convict labor for growing sugar cane, there's a clear record of their use of convict labor as sugar mill workers between 1909 and 1912. Now, Despite the heavy presence here in Fort Bend County, convict leasing was not unique to Fort Bend County. I, I cannot stress enough that this system was sanctioned by the state of Texas. It occurred across the state of Texas. Even after ending a private leases, the state continued the practice of using convict labor to achieve self-sufficiency of its own Texas prison system where they were making their own textiles, making their own tools, producing their own food. Uh, it's essentially a self-sufficient system. The image is here in 1888. If any of you take a drive to Austin, this is our Texas capital. That building as it currently stands today was built through the use of convict labor. So, as the video shows and as Mr. Mr. Blackman's book accounts for, this was not a Fort Bend system. This was not a Texas system. This was an American system. It occurred throughout the country as corporations and businesses all were built on the backs of convict labor. These headlines here allude to the, the progressive era that took place. And in 1910, prison reform actually was able to achieve the ending of convict labor for a private enterprise in Texas. And, and the system officially ended in 1912 after increased outcries for reform took place. These um, images you see here are from the San Antonio Express where they published a series of articles exposing the realities of what was taking place on those prisons. And by 1914, the state regained control of their prison labor force. They were no longer farming them out to other places. The shift was quiet and gradual as the prisons remained in operation. Nothing ever stopped. 
Now improvements were made. They rebuilt facilities and improved infrastructure and, and record keeping got a little bit better. And the day-to-day -day production of goods and products continued, but just under state regulation. Now, with so much pressure and contempt in the court of, of public opinion, many local governments, including that of Sugarland, didn't want to claim responsibility for instituting a system so reminiscent of slavery. I mean, who, who would? So I take you back to that initial question. Who are the Sugarland 95? And I'd like to give you a few more concrete details. So who are these individuals? According to prison records, an overwhelming number of prisoners were recorded as, as having no trade or occupation at the time of their conviction. They're simply noted as laborers. And, and laborer in this context was defined as a person who is able to perform unskilled work. To meet the demands, sheriffs were compelled and motivated to increase the number of prisoners to supply labor force during this era. And it led to the enforcement of laws for, for petty crimes that had hefty penalties. And during the peak of the convict leasing system, um, statistically, 60% were African American. 29% were Anglo and 11% were Hispanic or native descent. And it was during this system that the state of Texas became the primary proponent of racialized labor force in prisons. Classifying African Americans, there are documents where they request an African American labor force, where they're deemed as somewhat of a second class uh, of, of humans that were fit for hard labor. And they demanded that labor force to work in the fields. Now, with harsh statutes, including that of vagrancy, where vagrancy is that you're unemployed, part of the black codes, being a laborer with no work meant that you could be arrested. And majority of the, of the men who were convicted, uh, according to records, were convicted for crimes against property, such as theft, robbery, burglary. Many of the records even indicate that, that it was an intent to steal. And several of the records state that it was an intent to steal a farm animal or farm equipment of some sort. I need us to, to, to understand why that law in particular. Well, if you were enslaved prior to, the, to emancipation and now you were free, in an agrarian society, what would you need to be self-sufficient? You would need a horse or a shovel or a, or, or a pig to produce food. So it was well after, uh, it wasn't well after the Civil War that states swiftly took action to implement not only the black codes with restricted civil liberties and basic freedoms, but they also passed discriminatory laws that many of us don't know about called pig laws. And pig laws actually were laws that criminalized theft of farm animals and our equipment, right? Now, again, petty crime, heavy penalty. That's what's important. The labor conditions for convict leasey were often similar to that of slavery, if not worse. I need you to, to, to understand that during slavery, a, a human labor force was considered an asset. The owner had to pay for them. You had to invest in them, right? Whereas during this system, a laborer came with an extremely low overhead cost and they were easily replaced. If, if one was down, you, you got another one. From, the, from Huntsville. Convict faced extremely harsh living and working conditions um, that many of us would, would deem to be unbearable today. 
Now, according to the Sugarland Heritage Foundation's historical timeline, the inmates at the Imperial Farm work in wet sugar cane fields, many falling victim to periodic epidemics of fever, and the brutal working conditions caused the bitter convicts to call Sugarland the hellhole on the Brazos. There's an ex-convict by the name of Bill Mills who published a book. Uh, it's an account of his 25 years in the Texas prison system. And it was in his testimony that he described five of his 25 years at the Imperial Farm. And he says, quote, it was hell on earth. For this was the worst prison life I have ever spent in prison. I saw more cruelty and inhuman treatment in those five years in prison than I have seen in any other 20 years in prison. And it would take a very large book to print all those details. For those of you who may not be familiar with the area or even for those of us who are local who, who aren't quite sure of where this actually took place, it, this is where the James Reese Center is. You also see within that triangle, within eyes view, if you're actually at the site, is where the old Central Prison Farm was located. And then today there's the Fort Bend Children's Discovery Museum, which is actually at the site of the Imperial Farm. It's a very humbling experience if you have the chance to go to the site and stand there. All of these historic places are within eyes view. Now, I wanna answer the question, why did anyone know that was there? That is the lingering question. It should be noted that throughout the research, two and a half years of research conducted, there was no reference to Bullhead Camp Cemetery found in any deed conveyance, topographic map, county map, or official prison record. No vestige of the cemetery was noted in aerial photography dating from 1930 to 2016. There was only one mention of a cemetery associated with Bullhead Camp. A description of how bodies were buried at the camp was made in a testimony of a camp guard during a state senate investigation in 1909. I'd like to read that for you. You see, he says, yes, sir, I've seen them buried. All except one buried in convict clothes, coffin is made of rough lumber, clothing consisting of a shirt and pants. Coffins are made by the convicts out in the camp, lined with nothing. Generally have on each camp what is known as a convict graveyard. The Bullhead camp have a convict graveyard about 300 yards from the camp in the corner of a pasture. Yes, sir. As a rule, always put on a clean suit. In some cases, I have seen new suits put on, in other instances, wash suits. Yes, sir. Never seen but one buried in citizen's clothes. An old convict died under Captain Harris's nephew. Asked Captain Harris to bury him in citizen's clothes. That's the only one I ever seen buried in citizen's clothes. I never heard of them communicating with relatives before burying. One guard as a rule and three or four trustees go and put the corpse away. Yes, sir. About the ordinary depth of a grave. Had two dug myself and buried two while I was a sergeant. Same old style been the custom. I remember putting a pillow under one convict's head last year and I think had a little sheet but as a rule, just lay them in the coffin, pine box, put the name and the registered number on the head of the board. Now, we need to understand that the Bullhead Camp Cemetery was not known by that name upon its discovery. In fact, again, there, there's nothing known about its existence prior to unearthing the human remains on February 19, 2018. That was a historic moment where evidence of an age old injustice was in plain sight for the first time in 110 years. And it was the complex nature of record keeping or lack thereof that made the creation of a timeline of the name of the labor force even more important. You see, over time, not only did the ownership of land change hands, but so did the names of the labor forces that were working at the camp. 
So not to mention the term bullhead was colloquial. It was just a common reference used by the inmates and those working at the prison to refer to the placement of the camp near and along the Bullhead Bayou Creek. So we can understand now that with the changing of hands and the changing of names and no real documentation, it wasn't very difficult for this cemetery to get lost. This is an actual uh, a map that shows the exact location of the graves as they were found. Now, as I stated very early on, no headstones, no markers. This gives a, a rationale for the somewhat scattered nature of the cemetery. Um, you can see if you study the map, it's almost that there are three distinct phases of burials, right? Um, we have to understand that this is located along the historic banks of a bayou. And if you, I, I'm a Southern girl, if you've ever been along a bayou that hasn't been cut and cleared, the grass is high, there's brush overgrowth, animals. So if you aren't marking the grave sites and there's a lapse in time from when you go out there to bury someone else, chances are you won't remember where you buried the person prior. So this gives somewhat of uh, insight on the scattered nature. And in some cases, like right here, where they are um, in somewhat of a pattern, this um, correlates with potential uh, with natural disaster or, or pandemic epidemics, right? Fevers uh, running through the camp where several individuals were dying in, in close time frame of the same disease where those going out to bury them would be able to recognize where they had buried someone previously. So you don't see too much overlapping as you see here uh, in the middle section. Now, there's been lots of research. As I stated, we, we've been conducting research for over two years. And the research was, was conducted in the prison archives and in courthouse records to give us a more accurate picture of who these individuals are. Um, there's some very telling information about these men, including what they were arrested for, how long was their sentences, their punishments, and any illnesses they may have suffered. And pathology studies have, have indicated the possible causes of ailment or even death at, at the camp. Um, the image you see here is a gentleman who had a gunshot wound to the face. Now, face, ironically, that was not his cause of death. I believe that numbers also tell a good story. So for those of you who ask more information about, about the death of these people or who were these individuals, by age, the largest percentage of men convicted were between the age of 15 and 25, fairly young. The median sentence length given was five years. 24 is the median age of death amongst these young men. The youngest fatality being Mr. William Nash at the age of 16, who was serving four years for theft. Now, considering how they were treated, more than half of the men placed in the Bullhead Camp Labor Force died within a year of arriving at that camp. 78% died within two years. The most common causes of death were congestion of the bowel, brain, organs, gunshot following an attempted escape, pneumonia, and sunstroke. This, all of these things indicate poor working and living conditions at the camp. Now, the full report, as you see here in the image, back to bondage, um, and the executive summary of the report include a roster of the 71 individuals who were known to have died at the camp and three additional others um, who we found in records who are associated with the camp. This roster includes their names, their dates of birth, their, their original place of residence, their age of death, their conviction, their sentence and their time of death. It also includes notes that detail just some the, the 
incidents that occurred with those individuals? Were they punished? Did they get sick? Were they treated for something? Were they um, reprimanded? Um, are also included in that roster of the deceased. In total, there are approximately 3,000 convict deaths across the state of Texas during the 32 year period of convict leasing. Now, this is where it gets kind of personal for me. For those of you who know me, you know that I'm, I'm not from here. I'm from New Iberia, Louisiana, the proclaimed sugar capital of, uh, of the world, right? And we even have like the Sugar Cane Festival, it's the same time as Fort Bend County Fair. And when I decided to move to Texas and I got a job offer in Fort Bend, I, I remember moving here and driving through Sugar Land thinking, well, something is odd here because there's no sugar. <laughs> this is Sugar Land. I, I, I vividly recall calling home and, and, and talking to my, my grandpa saying, can you imagine that I'm moving to a place called Sugar Land and there's no sugar? And he too thought that was bizarre because where, where I grew up, my family home, you walk out of the door, there's cane on three sides and swamp in the back. No judgment there, okay? Um, so the idea that there was no cane in Sugar Land always puzzled me, but it wasn't until I started engaging in this work, I truly understood that there ain't no more cane on the Brazos. And that's even a song one of my, my friends in this work um, made me aware of that there's a song, Ain't No More Cane on the Brazos, a song that's, that's over 20 different renditions from Springfield, uh, for Springsteen, all the way to current contemporary um, bluegrass artists. And so I want to take a moment to actually play a small snip of the convict version that you would have heard on the camp, just to give you some uh, context about what was going on at the camp. I'm going to reshare. What's the matter? Something must be wrong. Oh. Keep on working, shorty joys, I'm gone. Oh, gotta come on the river in 19 folks. Oh, you could find a dead man. Mr. Bill Mills' account that I spoke to you earlier also talks about the ending of sugar production in Sugar Land. And he, he goes on to state that when they stopped raising sugar cane in Texas prisons, they eliminated one of the greatest causes of brutality in the system. As a person who grew up on a sugar farm, I, I saw firsthand just how physically taxing the work was, was on men who were of, of able body, who were well nourished, fed, rested. So I could only imagine the toll that, that harvesting and, and cultivating sugar had on such young bodies who experienced horrible conditions, poor nutrition, sometimes lack of clothing, lack of shelter, lack of food, no medical attention. Um, 
just thinking about the nature of that system is, is, it's inhumane. It's inhumane. So again, how did we, they get forgotten? In 1928, the last sugar crop was harvested in Fort Bend County. So by the end of the 20th century, the once booming sugar town of Sugarland had become distant from its long history of sugar planting, uh, despite the namesake remaining. And many of the landmarks that remain only told that sweet story of the old company town with very little evidence of the unsweet history of forced labor that was used to actually build the county, the city, and that company town. Now, there are some current landmarks, such as the old Imperial Farm Cemetery, located only a few yards west of the Forgotten Bullhead Camp Cemetery. Uh, it, prov it provides a snapshot of what took place at a, at a later point in time. But when we really think about how do they get forgotten, I mean, Sugarland is the hustling, bustling, prosperous, attractive place to live. We're proud to, to be here. But development, extremely rapid development, has, has somewhat contributed to this, this history being lost. But also with, with development, we've now found the Sugarland 95. And although they were lost to history and forgotten in the past, they are not forgotten today. After many months, the district felt it was finally necessary to provide these men a dignified and proper burial. In November of 2019, an honoring ceremony was held at the site. Prayers were recited, songs were sung. Participants walked down a candlelit path consisting of 95 candles. And at the conclusion, a bell was rung 95 times, once for each person laid to rest. Shortly after that event, the bodies were, in, were reinterred into their original resting places. Since then, a perimeter fence has been erected and, and last weekend, the markers were installed. I had the, the honor and the privilege to assist in that process, which I cannot articulate how moving and, and, and powerful that experience was. The site is open for daily visitation by the public. So why is this important? Why do I share this story with you and with anybody who cares to listen? We need to understand that the Bullhead Camp Cemetery was the first convict labor cemetery to be excavated in American history. And with this discovery of the cemetery, we as a district, as a community, as a people, have the opportunity to tell the story of those unfortunate and forgotten souls. We have an obligation to give them a voice and to tell the full history that has been lost and even left out. In the words of Maya Angelou, history, despite its wretching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. I must also stress the fact that these individuals cannot and should not be minimized as convicts or prisoners or people of poor character. These men were sons, husbands, fathers, friends. And in 1870, the population of Fort Bend County was 77% African-American. And although the men who were laid to rest were not all from Fort Bend County, their history, their legacy, their lives are important to a huge portion of our community as it stands today. And without direct descendants, honoring and paying tribute to these souls who were met with injustice and suffering in their lifetime should be the commitment of the communal descendants, those people like us walking the earth today. And whether you are of African descent, heritage, or you identify as a person of color, this should not play a factor in realizing that the convict leasing system was wrong. And that keeping the history hidden is, is shameful. The brutal history of slavery, convict leasing, Jim Crow, segregation, on and on, has, has caused a degree of hurt within our community. 
And as an article that was shared with me by a dear friend this, this week stated, hurt does not go away on its own. It needs to be spoken. It needs to be heard. For you cannot heal what you do not understand. So I personally live my life by the adage that when you know better, you do better. And as a district, as a city, as a county, as, as an audience here today, we now know better. So we need to do better by the lives of those known as the Sugarland 95. As a district, I want to make sure we highlight some of the things that we've done on our end we have promoted education and awareness of the Sugarland 95, um, and we've had several moments that we can definitely be proud of. In addition to providing our students here in the district with enrichment and, and engagement opportunities, such as they were even at the site during excavation, uh, the social studies team was able to create and get our board of trustees to adopt a local standard which allows for the, the teaching and the learning of the Sugarland 95 and other local history that may not be included in our state standards into our US history and Texas courses. Um, one of our most recent successes came in the spring when I was able to work with State Board of Education representatives on proposing an amendment to the African American Studies course. And so it is with great pride and delight that Fort Bend ISD can say that students across the state of Texas who, who take this course will be learning about the Sugarland 95 because it is written into the standard itself. So as a district, we are leading our, our other local districts and other schools in providing them with this information that is critical to making sure we all have an understanding of what actually occurred. One of the questions that I often get is, oh, what's next? Where do we go from here? Uh, a permanent fund has been established by the University of Connecticut to support the DNA extraction and related costs for the Sugarland 95, which includes, but is not limited to, DNA analysis, comparisons of existing databases, public outreach, and genealogical studies. If you choose to donate, you can receive a tax letter from the University of Connecticut foundation. It is our hopes that once the analysis is concluded, which will take a long time, that ancient DNA uh, data and the genealogical studies will allow for descendants to be located because it's only through this extensive research we'll ever know the true impact of how this system impacted the families and the lives of those deceased. Now, if you open a textbook that school-age children take, you, you're going to find zero reference to convict leasing in any of them. I've, I've looked through dozens. But this is no secret in the world of academia. There are several books that um, you can refer to if you want more in-depth information. Two of the, the top books right here, Texas Tough by Robert Perkinson's is specific to the Texas system. And then there's Penology for Profit by Donald Walker. Um, I would advise anyone read those two. If you want some immediate online resources, um, I, I urge everyone to go to www.fortbenisd.com front slash Sugarland 95. There you will find uh, the executive summary and the full report. Now the full report is, is 500 plus pages long. The executive summary kind of abbreviates that for the, for the consumer of information if you, if you are interested. The Rice University Fondren Library, the Woodson Center, has a great collection. Lots of the research done by Mr. Reginald Moore is actually um, included. I, I encourage anyone to take a look at, at that as well. And then we also have the Texas State Historical Association and our very own Sugarland Heritage Foundation all give reference to the convict leasing system. As I wrap up today, um, I would like an opportunity to, to, I would like to extend an opportunity for everyone here to somewhat reflect on what we now know. Because for many of you, this is information you did not know. And as we, as we take a moment to reflect and think about any possible questions you might have, you can go ahead and type those into the chat. I'm going to close out with this video 
um, for us to, to sit back and, and kind of ponder on the new information that we have. point I will open it up to Mr. Rice for some Q&A. Chastity, thank you very much for that very sobering and in-depth presentation. It had a lot of information that I had not heard before and I think I've learned a lot today and uh, so everyone that's on the presentation, the chat is open. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in there and Chastity will be available to answer those questions. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, congratulatory comments, Chastity, about being an excellent presentation and wondering if your uh, speech is available to read as well, a lot of detail. Uh, let's see, we may have a new uh, message. To answer that question, Mr. Rice, um, I'm sure this has not been recorded yet. Um, I've just been engaging in live presentations. Most, if not all, of the information that was used can be found in the executive summary. Uh, I wouldn't uh, demand that everyone read 500 plus pages unless you have a, a, a time. Um, I've actually read the, the, the full report several times now, and every time I find something more and more interesting. Um, so I encourage any of you with an interest to read both the full report, because uh, it's, it's a work of art. The Texas Historical Commission actually said it was the best report that they had ever reviewed. Um, and so, uh, but if you don't have the time to dig into the full report, I encourage you to actually look at the executive summary and hopefully we'll have more information forthcoming. Okay, uh, here is a question, uh, and that is, will each grave have a marker, and can, can the site be visited? Yes, each grave currently has a marker. Um, the site can be visited. I believe the visitation hours, uh, don't quote me, I think Monday through Friday is nine to dusk and the weekend it's dusk to dawn. Um, for those of you who go out and visit the site, I, I wanna make sure you understand. So although there were 95 bodies numerically, we did a lot of digging. And so there were uh, instances where we dug and we didn't find a body, but that, that, that actual site still got a number. So the numbering system isn't necessarily one through 95 because we've taken account into all of the actual sites that we dug. Um, but if anybody needs a map, we can make that available online as well. So you can see which, which numbers actually have um, a burial. Here is a question. Who authored the Fort Bend ISD report? The Fort Bend ISD report was done um, myself in conjunction with Rain Clark, who was an archeologist, who was the, the chief archeologist at the site. He was the principal writer of that report. We also um, worked in collaboration with other contributors to that report to make sure that um, it was in alignment with the report. Um, there's several people who have chimed in along the way. I, I can't go without giving a shout out to Teresa Jack and Helen Graham for all of their work. Um, it, it, it was a 
creating the executive summary was important to make sure that it was directly in line with the full report. So that's why even though um, we worked on it as a team in Fort Bend, we also worked with the actual contributors to the original report. And that report is available on the Fort Bend ISD website. Yes. And that's the www.fortbendisd.com forward slash Sugarland 95. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, here is a question. Is anything being done to establish a memorial or research center to expand access or education about the Sugarland 95 beyond Sugarland in Texas? Well, to answer that question, um, I, I believe that this is an American story, right? And this information should go beyond um, Fort Bend ISD, Fort Bend County. Where we are today are in very initial phases of imagining what that could look like. Um, we have several community groups who also have a vested interest in this work. And we have been meeting and discussing um, to, to, to really kind of imagine what this can look like, but not just as a district effort, but as a community-wide effort, because it is important. It's important that we share this information, um, not only in an ISD setting, but as leaders in our community, we, again, I, I consider this like an opportunity. My director always says low hanging fruit, right? This is an opportunity in our hands to really lead the way and be innovative. And, and as a school district who stumbled upon this discovery, there's so many opportunities that we can, we can uh, take advantage of to be leaders and, and compassionate citizens as we advocate uh, extremely in this district. I had another question, and that was, uh, and since uh, you've been following this in, in the local newspaper, is there anything that uh, you wish that they had included heretofore uh, that you felt might have been left out? In thinking about the coverage thus far, one, just, again, this is my personal opinion. Um, I think we have a lot of coverage about the discovery and what Fort Bend ISD has done and has not done, but there's a degree of onus here on the state and on the county that hasn't really been highlighted um, in the work. Not to cast a negative light or to encourage people to be resentful or, or, or angry, but again, that idea that you can't heal without acknowledging, right? And acknowledgement doesn't have to inspire regression or aggression. It can actually inspire transformation, right, um, of a community, especially when it's a topic that's so important. So that's one of the things that I, I, I wish we could see more of in, in press is like, this was found in Fort Bend, but we now know how it came to be. So what what is our state saying about this? What is our our our, our government as a whole saying to, to, to at least acknowledge that it occurred so that way we can find ways to restore our community and, and repair after such horrible uh, inhumanities took place. Another question is um, asking how, let me get to it here, how, how do they, I guess, meaning Fort Bend ISC, plan to inform the community about the African-American history that will include the history of the Sugar Land 95? Right, a great question. Um, so the African-American Studies course was finally approved in, in April and the standards actually weren't released until recently. Um, in Fort Bend ISD, we have a very detailed curriculum writing process, one that is done to ensure that our curriculum is of quality, that it's rigorous, that it's balanced, it's unbiased. Um, and it's done with, especially our social studies curriculum, it's done with critical thinking in mind. And so we're gonna launch into that curriculum writing process uh, shortly. We typically start uh, towards the end of the fall semester, beginning of the spring. And in that process, we include a, a, a variety of stakeholders, uh, teachers, administrators, I, I do recognize the sensitivity of this topic and in other districts there is some degree of community input on those courses and as community engagement coordinator I am 
uh, working with our social studies team to, to think about how that might look to make sure that the community is also reflected and represented. I'm also working with other individuals um, who are part of historic preservation societies across the, the, the state and the country to make sure that the African American studies course that we develop here in Fort Bend also highlights some very specific individuals, events across our state that we can, we can showcase in that curriculum. So it, it won't be a cookie cutter American history course. One of the things that, um, that Dr. Dupree has expressed is that he doesn't want our ethnic studies, either African-American or Mexican-American studies course to be designed with a textbook in mind. So we hope to design those courses with primary sources, real life examples, firsthand accounts. So our students really get a full, deep, rich and robust learning experience, not just a, a textbook cookie cutter course. And so you have you testified before the State Board of Education on this matter and to get this incorporated into Texas history books. Is, is that what you were saying earlier? So that's actually next, Mr. Rice. Um, so the way that the African American Studies course came about was I delivered a similar presentation in the spring, in February, to the Texas Social Studies Supervisors Association. And in that audience were uh, State Board of Education representatives who advocate on behalf of social studies. Following that presentation, they immediately came up to me and they said like, we, we are embarrassed. We've advocated for social studies for 25 plus years and we had no knowledge that this occurred. How can we get this into curriculum? And so in discussing it with, with a few of the reps, we thought that the African American Studies course, which was currently on the table at the time, was the launching pad, right? And so I crafted some amendments and, and they chose the one that we, I presented earlier to be the one that they put forth um, in front of the state board. I didn't get to testify because that was at the peak of uh, COVID. So their meetings were virtual, but I was happy to see that the amendment that I submitted was brought forth and it was unanimously voted voted on. So what is the next step? So now that we've got it into uh, African American studies here in Texas, we know the power that Texas has in the education world. So the goal is to eventually make making sure that convict leasing gets into the hands of students across the country and is incorporated into those mainstream K-12 textbooks where applicable. Yes, because I think I heard you say in your presentation, this is the first uh, a grave site to be on earth that, that lends history and documentation of the convict leasing program in the country. Absolutely, yes. So your work is really groundbreaking in that regard and uh, your goal is to have that incorporated not just here in Fort Bend ISD into the curriculum but statewide and perhaps the textbooks will pick that up for a, the rest of the 49 states in the country. Correct, that is the goal. That is, that is the goal. And so uh, I know you've been working on this and uh, I guess the final report was recently completed and, and this presentation is recently completed and, and, and that's one reason that you're here today uh, through the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for the folks watching this, the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce has many divisions within it that speak to uh, uh, government uh, to infrastructure and education is one of those and so anytime we have an opportunity to share some noteworthy topic or uh, things of interest pertaining to education we do this and uh, Chastity reached out to me and I was only too happy to uh, have this opportunity and we were discussing earlier that if there are any benefits to COVID uh, one of them is that we're able to reach many more people than no we normally would if we were meeting in person. I mm -hmm. think we had almost uh, over a hundred people on, on this uh, screen and it's been live streamed on Facebook as well. So there have been a hundred people just on, on the Zoom webinar and I'm not sure how many with, uh, through the Facebook, but well, let's see, Chastity, I think, uh, 
that might be all the questions that we have for today. If, if people wanted to contact you to provide additional information or queries about the curriculum that you are developing, is there a way for them to do that? Absolutely. I've actually made it easy because my, my last name is no, <laughs> no easy feat. And so typing it out is a little difficult. So if anyone wants to contact me, I urge you to email sugarland95 at fortbendisd.com. That is a specialized email associated with um, the Sugarland 95 work. Again, that's sugarland95, all one word, at fortbendisd.com. And that communication comes directly to me and I'm able to, to provide and, and provide assistance and to uh, collaborate with, with any and everyone who, who reaches out. Um, I look forward to giving this, converse, this talk to any and everyone who, who has an hour to listen. And I thank you again, Mr. Rice, for all of the work that you do and for having me here today. Well, we're delighted that you took the time uh, and we have many, many compliments of your presentation today. It was very moving. And for everyone in the audience, we've been visiting with Ms. Chastity Alanu Alade, who is the coordinator for community and civic engagement for Fort Bend ISD. And that email again, Chastity, was, uh, tell me the email again, just one more time, please. For people. It's Sugarland95. Sugarland95. At FortBendISD.com. At FortBendISD.com. And anybody that, uh, sends that to you, you'll get that and you can hear what they have to say and correspond and so forth. Absolutely. I welcome any comment and or feedback as well. Well, thank you again for being here. It was an excellent presentation. Very well done. Thank you. And thank you for everybody for carving out the time within your busy, busy day to join us today. And this is one way to help get the message out. So I agree. I agree. Before we close, I just have a couple of uh, announcements about some upcoming events. On Thursday, September 24th at 12 o'clock noon, we will have the Business and Professional Division hosting uh, a seminar called Successfully Pivoting During a Pandemic, and that will be a Zoom webinar. And then on Wednesday, October 14th at 11.30 a.m., the Education Division will host the 13th annual State of the Schools luncheon. Not sure if that's gonna be in person or a Zoom webinar just yet. We'll have to wait a little bit longer to see. And so we wanna sign off by saying thank you again for, for being with us and uh, we hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.